Jenny Turner, Lovejoy Real Estate. Today we're here with Carrie Weinkoop, owner of Seller 503, and we're gonna talk about small businesses. Hi, I'm Carrie Weinkoop. I'm the owner of Seller 503. Seller 503 is a wine club, similar to a winery wine club, but instead of sending our members wines from just one winery, we send them wines from small producers all over the state of Oregon. So talk to me a little bit about how, like, why? How did you get started? Why did you want to focus on the small, tiny wineries? Uh, so my background is not actually in the wine industry. Uh, my husband and I own another business, uh, and I was honestly sort of getting bored with that and wanted to do something fun for myself. So I started taking wine uh, education classes just for fun in the evenings. Uh, and about halfway through my first wine certification course, I really caught the wine bug. And I was like, I want to be involved in this industry. But I didn't know how. I knew that I didn't know enough to be a winemaker. I knew that I didn't want to work in restaurants. We had a right. small at the time and so I really played around with a bunch of different ideas and nothing really stuck and one day I said to my husband look I just want someone to send me wine from small producers all over the state to my door so I don't have to do all the research and he's over there googling like oh this would be a great present and he's like nothing exists like that he said you should start a business and i said you're crazy we don't need a second business in our life <laughs> yeah. and six he's, a, he's a dreamer right yeah. like he's the entrepreneur dreamer <laughs> and six months later seller 503 was born um so you know oregon wine um often is regarded as some of the best wines in the United States, if not the world. Um, they take up you know, several of the top 10 spots on wine enthusiasts, top 100 wines. Okay. They're really well regarded. And yet, outside the state of Oregon, you have a very hard time finding Oregon wines, totally. particularly any of the small ones. You can get King Estate, A to Z, Sokol Blosser um, in lots of places, but that's just about it. Right. And so I wanted to show people um, that Oregon wine could be affordable and could be approachable and fun, and that you could really have an opportunity to explore lots of small producers that you don't have access to. So talk about those small producers. Like, mm -hmm. how big is, like, what is small? And do these guys have wineries where you can go and taste, or are these more, like, are they even smaller than that? So I made up an arbitrary number just because I needed to have some sort of guideline for myself. Um, my number is 10,000 cases, um, so I only work with wineries who make less than 10,000 cases. Now, okay. most of my wineries are substantially smaller than that. I work with people who make 300 cases. Um, I work on average, my folks I work with sort of are in the 1,000 to 3,000 case range. Okay. Um, but the Oregon Wine Board just came out with some updated statistics that 70% of the wineries in Oregon make five thousand or less cases wow. so that's substantial yep, there's a lot um, and even in the almost eight years that I have done seller 503 we've doubled the number of wineries in this state so we're getting close to a thousand wineries in this state uh, so I have lots of choice which yep. is really amazing um, and I all of these wineries you know they have all sorts of different stories. Some of them have actual physical wineries. Many of them don't. Many, especially of the port, uh, in Portland here and the urban wineries, they don't actually have a physical space or a tasting room. They're working together in collaborative spaces. They're buying grapes from other places and coming and working together to create their wines. Um, and it's sort of like every variation in between. Okay. Are, how, can, how does Seller 503 support them? Like, what do you do? I mean, obviously exposure, mm -hmm. right? That's one of it. Mm -hmm. Is that the main way you're supporting these small businesses? Yeah, so it's interesting when I started Seller 503 because I didn't come from a distribution background or a wine background. And so my, my model always was, well, we're partners. We're in this together. I call them my winery partners. Um, and uh, a lot of wineries were like, what are you doing? This doesn't make <laughs> sense. Because their experience with, with wine clubs Clubs, and there are a few sort of big national ones out there, is that they buy the wine, they push the winemakers down on price as hard as they can, they sort of get the bottom of the barrel dregs, and then they send it out to their people and they walk away and the wineries never hear from them again. And that was never my model. Right. Um, so I consider them to be my, wine, my partners. Once you're a Seller 503 winery partner, you are always a partner. So we okay. do things like, during the month that I feature them, we do lots of social media. We invite them to come here to pour at the tasting room um, during 
during that month. But then in addition, we offer other opportunities. Like we do a wine festival every year yeah. called Poor Oregon, where they are invited to come. So they get access particularly to the market here in Portland. Um, we also have a member benefits card um, where wineries can participate in that. And that gives our uh, wine club members free or discounted tastings at about 80 different wineries around the state. So it really is a partnership. It really is a partnership. And we try to find as many opportunities as we can to highlight them. For example, when I have press who come in and want to learn more about Cellar 503, I will take them to meet some of my winery partners as well. Um, so it's, it's really um, an opportunity for all of us to talk about amazing Oregon wine. What do you think, like what's your favorite Oregon wine? Do you have a favorite? That's like asking who your favorite kid is. I, I hate know. that question. I know. But like, do you have a favorite? Um, you know, dirty little secret that is like sort of controversial. I'm not actually a Pinot fan. Um, I'm not I'm, actually a Pinot fan either. I like bigger reds. Um, yeah. So I love the reds coming from Southern Oregon. If you can see the map on the wall behind me, this is all of the growing regions or AVAs in the state. Um, I like the reds from Southern Oregon. You're getting a lot of Spanish varietals down there. Mm -hmm. Tempranillo um, is one of my favorites. Uh, and then for whites, I really like the high acid crisp whites that are coming from here in the Willamette Valley. Pinot Blanc, um, Pinot Gris, um, and then some of the more unusual ones like Gruner Veltlinger is one of my favorites. Um, so is that sweet? Uh, it is not sweet. Um, it can be. Some places um, in Austria make a sweet Gruner Veltlinger, but sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> it's, it's not actually traditionally sweet. Interesting. So for people listening that maybe aren't very knowledgeable about wine, right? Mm -hmm. Like they might think your Gruner, whatever you just said that I can't even pronounce, is sweet. Uh -huh. Where would you say to start? Like what would be a good starting place? Well, that's one of the reasons why I created Cellar 503 is because I wanted to encourage people to explore. And uh, I like to say that if you are drinking lots of wine in this world, you will find wines that you don't like. But yep. the goal is also to find wines that you do like. So tasting a huge variety of wine is really the way to learn about wine and to figure out what you like. Um, so we pick two different reds and two different whites, each from a different producer every single month. Okay. So you're getting a huge variety in the club so that people have the opportunity to really figure out, oh, I actually like the bigger reds, mm. or no, I really do like Pinot Noir. Um, so I think the best way for people to start exploring in wine is actually tasting it. And whether it's a wine club like ours, or it's going out to visit some wineries, or it's even grocery store tastings, you know, especially around the holidays, right. there's lots of tasting opportunities opportunities. It's interesting because I would have told you I don't like Syrahs mm -hmm. because Syrahs have a lot of pepper. Mm. And then Charles and I went to Australia and I love Australian Syrahs. Mm -hmm. Syrahs. So like it's just a different like you just like different regions really yep. do make a big difference in what the flavors are and what the tastes are and what does it come from. Absolutely. So Willamette Valley is actually growing some Syrah um, and it is a lighter more elegant style of Syrah than you're going to get from any of the warmer regions in the state. I do not like Syrah from the from the Walla Walla Valley area because it tastes like dirt and yep. leather and it's too overwhelming. But the Syrahs that are grown here in the Willamette Valley are some of my favorites. Interesting. So maybe something to try, mm -hmm. right? I agree. Like I think it's the trying the small. Like I love, I love when we travel seeing Oregon wines on places. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. um, I was just somewhere and they were serving a Raff, mm -hmm. which is it's fine. fine. Like it's not my favorite, but it was kind of nice that it was an Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. And I purposely didn't choose it. I chose something that was a little bit more you know, interesting because I don't see it as much, mm -hmm. but it was nice to see an Oregon wine on the list, right? Mm -hmm. And that was in Florida, so it was a ways away, um, but they, they don't get a lot of exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing is to know that, um, like we just said about Syrah, that it can be a different style in different places. You know, one of that education piece is what we're really all about here at Cellar 503 as well, because oftentimes, a lot of times, I get people in here who are like, I hate Chardonnay. I hate Chardonnay, I don't want Chardonnay. And I have a conversation with them of like, no, actually, I don't think you hate Chardonnay. I think you hate California Chardonnay, <laughs> which has a reputation for being oaky mm -hmm. and buttery and you know, tasting like movie popcorn. And there's a contingency of people who like that, but most people don't. Yeah. And so I have take the opportunity to educate them about Oregon Chardonnay, which is much more French in style than it is in California in style. It's lighter and more acid to it and less oaky. Um, and it's a great way to be able to, again, educate yourself about wine by trying the same grape, but from different places. Right. I love that you were not in the industry mm -hmm. and like just kind of did some stuff for yourself. And then you're like, no, I can figure out a niche, right? Like, I don't think we do that enough in life where it's like, I want to be part of this mm -hmm. and I want to add value 
And what does that look like? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I think it, it is a very interesting way to get into the industry, especially this industry, which is actually fairly insular of like, you may not know that you want to be a winemaker from the, you know, from when you're 12 or something, but once you're in it, you're in it and you're working your way up generally is how it goes. So to kind of insert it in a different direction, it's pretty unusual. And people were a little like skeptical of me at first, but really the nice thing is because I have a background in marketing and in business, that really was my expertise. And then I learned the wine knowledge that I needed to by taking wine certification courses and just over time of course. by meeting with people um, and really figured out that that was my passion and I was going to then apply my expertise and my business savvy to something that I was really passionate about. Well, and you think about it just like in real estate, like you can be really good at selling houses, but not a really good business person. Yep. And you could probably be a really great winemaker, but not understand the marketing and the business side of it, right? I can't tell you how many times I talked to winemakers who were like, I just wanted to make wine because I love wine. And then I didn't realize I had to sell it. <laughs> and like, if you can't sell it, then you have a problem. Right. And, and that is one of the, um, you, you know, one of the inspirations for Seller 503 was this little tiny, tiny winery in the middle of nowhere down in Southern Oregon, outside of Medford, over the river, through the woods, bridge, no cell reception. And we got there. I don't even know how we got there, but we got there. And the owner winemaker was a retired firefighter. Okay. He had planted his own vineyard, cleared the land himself, built his own place, taught himself how to make wine and the wine was fabulous and no one would ever find it. Right. I mean, there was maybe two grocery stores in Medford that could, you know, that could sell it, but he was never going to get right. people to come because he didn't know how to do the marketing and he didn't know how to do the social media and build the website or t- and, yeah. you know, learn how to sell it. Uh, and I wanted the word to be out about him and other folks like him. One of our favorite wine experiences was Adia. A D E A, do you know them? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Somehow, like we stumbled across them, and they're not like they're not way out in the middle of nowhere. But mm-hmm. it was, at the time we did it, and this was probably ten years ago, they were super small. Mm-hmm. And like we called and said, "Hey, can we come by?" And they're like, "Yep, yeah, no problem. He'll be back in about ten minutes." And he rolled up on his Harley <laughs> and like opened up his like barn where he was doing it, and like awesome. gave us a private tasting. And it was like it's like it like from a memory perspective, and it was a fabulous wine. Mm-hmm. And same thing, like super tiny, like it's not you can't walk into Safeway and find it. Right. But it's figuring out like what, how how is it accessible? Yeah, those are the moments that I think really inspired me to get involved with wine. Um, is is those kind of memories that stick in your head when you're talking to the winemaker, when you're having those really intimate one-on-one experiences, and you can see the passion of the winemaker and see why they did this and what their training is and and you know how they want to express themselves through those wines. I um, Southern Oregon is still one of my favorite places to visit because it's still fairly off the radar. Yep. Almost all of the time you're going to get to meet the winemaker. The tasting fees are, if there are any, are very reasonable. There's no traffic. And I remember a long time ago before starting Cellar 503 when our son was very small and we were tasting down there and we rolled up some gravel road and uh, a little kid with no shirt on went running, Dad, someone's here to taste a <laughs> wine. And uh, Jake, our son, was asleep in the car, and they literally came out and served me the wine in the car, which don't do that. That's illegal. But, <laughs> but the but thought was, was really nice. Yeah, the thought was really nice, and the wines <laughs> yeah. were awesome, and we bought a bunch to support yep. this, this small producer. Yep. Nope. That's, I mean, that's, those are the stories, right? Mm-hmm. And it's people following their passion. Mm-hmm. In that case, it's just their passion happens yeah. to be wine. And, the, and one of my passions in Seller 503 is telling those stories. So yeah. in every shipment that I get out, I write a story about the winemaker, how they got into this business, what their passion is, um, and as well as tasting notes for the wine. And really, I want people to know more than just the label and just what the bottle is. I want them to be able to hold on to those cards or take it to a dinner party and say, I have this great wine. Isn't this story great? Yeah. And that really, that connection is everything. Well, the power is the story behind it, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just like do you like it or not like yep. okay yeah I like it or maybe I don't like it mm-hmm. but where did it come from what's the history what's mm-hmm. the story mm-hmm. how did these people get into this crazy business yeah so women in wine mm-hmm. is it traditionally a female managed business I feel like it would mostly be yeah. male winemakers yeah definitely historically has been very a male dominated business but interestingly enough the Oregon wine board just put out some statistics that in Oregon 33 percent of winemakers are women and that is more than any other wine growing region in the world Interesting. Uh, so we are have room for for growth there for sure um, but we here in Oregon are doing pretty well uh, and one a, a winemaker that I uh, got to know and have featured in the 
club before and is actually from France originally and is a woman. And she was talking about this and she's like, I don't understand why men are winemakers. I mean, women, we take care of all the things. We take care of the kids. We take care of the vines. We take care of the wines once they go into the barrel. I don't understand why all winemakers aren't women. It was, <laughs> it was a pretty hilarious conversation. But, you know, we are definitely working hard on that here in Oregon. Um, and I spend uh, one shipment every year in May for Mother's Day. I feature all women winemakers. That's fun. Uh, and I try to, of course, sprinkle them in as much as I can other places. But I do try to, to draw attention to them. If someone wanted to be a winemaker, what's the path? Well, there's sort of two different paths these days. One is that you go get actual training. So uh, here in Oregon, Schmeckata Community College has really got a fabulous enology program, and you can focus either on winemaking or wine sales or um, actually vineyard management work. Um, UC Davis down in California is sort of the grand dame of, of enology programs. Or you just start in the cellar and you work your way up. Um, there's definitely a lot of folks in the industry these days who got a job selling wine or they got a job in the fields. It piqued their interest. They started working in the cellar. They got trained by a winemaker and then sort of have moved on Growing to their own, through it. their own brand. Yep. Um, I know Carlton Studios. Mm -hmm. Carlton Winemaker Studio. Yes. Mm -hmm. They kind of support some winemakers that way too, right? They Where do. you can come together there mm -hmm. and the smaller wineries can use the equipment and use the... Yeah, it's a shared or a collaborative space um, where they have about 12 to 15 winemakers at any one time who are all doing their own projects there. Um, and so they can use, all use the same equipment, not have to put that huge investment into the equipment and the space um, and be able to support it themselves. It has to be expensive. It's very expensive. Are there other collaborations like that one? There are. There's uh, informal and formal ones. Actually, it's very common in Southern Oregon, much more so than up here in the Willamette Valley, um, that you have wineries called Custom Crush Wineries, where there is a winery who brings in grapes from vineyards all over and makes different labels, but all within one facility and one winemaker. Because there's lots of folks down in Southern Oregon who have vineyards, but don't have the training or the interest in becoming a winemaker. That's right. becoming more common up here in the Willamette Valley. There are also shared spaces where a winery buys a building and buys the equipment and realizes I can't really afford to do this by myself and so yeah. they invite their friends in to come in yeah. um, and, and help them there but the the collaborative spaces are becoming more and more popular as it's more, harder and harder to get into the wine industry right. um, and uh, and harder to afford a piece of land harder to afford the equipment do most of the organ winemakers do you think they own their own like are they making wine out of their own grapes or are they buying grapes? Or is it just all over the board? I don't know what the statistics are on that, but it is all over the board. Um, so for example, as I mentioned, Portland has a great urban winery scene, which I love. It was one of my inspirations for starting yeah. Cellar 503. Um, and the winemakers who are here are, are don't have any property, and they are buying grapes from all over the state of Washington, of Washington and Oregon to be able to make their wine. And it really allows for a lot more creativity and passion to come through. You're not just tied to a piece of land that has right. one grape or two Two grapes planted on it and so you have to make the same thing every year um, but there are certainly lots of of brands who have a piece of property and they are growing their own grapes and they yeah. are making their own wine so it is kind of all over the map and for the bigger ones of course like Soka Blosser owns mm -hmm. their land and owns their grapes and does it so you could see it on that scale a lot better mm -hmm. than on the little ones right yep, like exactly. maybe you can't have enough so mm -hmm. how much property do you think you have to have planted in grapes to be able to like actually make wine well, I mean, you know, you could have as little as one acre or even half an acre. You wouldn't make a lot of wine at that, yep. at that, op at that chance. But we do have some wine makers who do a hybrid of things, right? They have a small piece mm. of property. They're growing, for example, just Pinot Noir. Uh, but then they're buying grapes from other places to be able to have a full lineup of other options to mix for it their in guests. And do it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Carrie, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Jenny Turner, Lovejoy Real Estate. Follow us, like us, listen to us wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Carrie Winecoop of Cellar 503. If you want a chance to explore all sorts of amazing Oregon wines, check out our website, www.cellar503.com. <laughs>